Ten years ago, there was a war between churches. Army emergent took arms against fortress traditional. Or is it the other way around? Dr. Jim Belcher wrote a book calling for a ceasefire. Did it work? Ten years later, do we still care? Find out in Reading and Readers. Hi, my name is Terence and I'm your host for Reading and Readers, a podcast where I review Christian books for you. Every month, I review Faith Life's free book of the month. In 2021, the January free ebook was Deep Church, A Third Way Beyond Emerging and Traditional by Dr. Jim Belcher. When he wrote this book, Belcher was the founding and lead pastor for Redeemer Presbyterian Church in Newport Beach, California. Redeemer Church, also known as Redeemer Orange County, features so prominently in this book that the church gives out a free copy of this book to first-time visitors. When it comes to the emerging church, Belcher is both an insider and outsider. He asked the same questions the emerging church asked, and he did experiment with different ways of doing church. But he also ended up establishing the traditional church, which is the Presbyterian church, and affirming traditional doctrines. Ten years later, in, um, in the LA Together podcast, uh, Belcher reflects, the big conversation at the time was with the emerging church, and there was a lot of conflict between what I call the traditional church and the emerging church. I knew both sides really well, so I wrote a book to explain both sides to each other like a good marriage counsellor and I would present a third way, end quote. So what was that conflict? Belcher observes that there were seven protest points against the traditional church. Number one, the traditional church was captive to enlightenment rationalism, that much of truth depends on reason. Number two, the traditional church had a very narrow view of salvation. It focused too much on how people are saved, justification, atonement, and not how a Christian lives. Number three, there is uh, too much emphasis on belief before belonging, that there are boundaries uh, set up so that we can know who is in and who is out, and they do not attract people into the church. Number four, the traditional church has uncontextualized worship, meaning music that is 100 years old does not appeal to the current generation. Number five, Ineffective preaching. The traditional church makes speeches rather than attempt to be relational, making it meaningful to the day-to-day -day, uh, Christian. Number six, weak ecclesiology. The traditional church is more interested in protecting the existing structure than changing to the times. Number seven, tribalism. The traditional church is against culture, and instead of being the salt and light, it is attacking culture. Belcher writes, There are many areas of emerging theology and ministry with which I wholeheartedly agree. They desire many of the things I embrace and they dislike many of the things I don't like about evangelicalism. But I also have deep misgivings about areas of their thought and practice. I am caught in between and am comfortable with this ambiguity. It allows me to learn from both the traditional church and the emerging church as I follow a different route, the deep church. There are two parts in this uh, book. The first part, there are three chapters, and they are talking about, uh, the first chapter is there from the start, where he, he explains where he's coming from and how he actually was part of the emerging movement. And that's how he can define. In uh, chapter two, he defines the emerging church, and we see that the emerging movement it's, uh, it's a wide movement, and uh, people inside do not necessarily agree with each other. And the third chapter is the quest for mere Christianity. You see, deep church is a phrase coined by C.S. Lewis in his book, Mere Christianity. The idea is uniting in the essentials. And in deep church, Belcher is uh, proposing that the essentials here are the great traditions, the Apostles' Creed, Nicene Creed, and Athanasian Creed. And we would want to see Christians uniting uh, in these uh, fundamentals, these essentials, rather than fight among themselves while uh, world watches. So that is part one. Part two, if you remember the seven protests 
points made by the emerging church, we have seven chapters to deal with each point. And the chapters are titled this way, Deep Truth, Deep Evangelism, Deep Gospel, Deep Worship, Deep Preaching, Deep Ecclesiology, and Deep Culture. And the book ends with conclusion, notes, and acknowledgements. In terms of his writing style, Belcher did say that he was attempting to bring two parties to a marriage counselling. And in marriage counselling, you have the husband saying this, you have the wife saying that, and the counsellor saying, let us build a bridge. Now, in order to build a bridge, you need to have trust. So one of the major points about this book is that Belcher actually visits the people that he is talking to. So it's not talking about, he actually talks to the people and he actually records what they say and thus giving them a voice in his book. So he talks to both sides. In marriage counselling, you have husband and wives saying things like, he always or she always. And one of the things we learn is don't use the word always. Well, in this book, you find that the emerging church does not always mean abandoning traditional doctrine. There are some who don't think that way. And you also see that traditional church does not always mean stuffy hymns and boring sermons. Now, in terms of writing style, this book is not just a back-and-forth conversation, and nor is it a textbook uh, or systematic theology on what is the church. In fact, this book is very interesting because it's written in a memoir form. So the conversations between both the emerging and the traditional church is actually part of his journey. So let me read the opening uh, chapter of this book. In the early 1990s, I was working on my PhD in political philosophy at Georgetown University. I lived blocks from the university in the basement apartment of a wealthy woman who was in her late 70s. I walked her dog twice a day for free rent. Not a bad gig for a poor graduate student. End quote. So you see, this is the, the sort of flavor he brings you through uh, the entire book. And you are continuing on in his journey. Now, let me give you an example so you better understand what I mean. There's this chapter uh, titled Deep Evangelism. And in here, he is addressing the question, do you believe first or do you belong first? The emergent church says that we should belong first. And later on, people will slowly believe. The traditional response is that that never happens because we are so busy trying to make them feel belonging, being nice, making them comfortable and attracting them and so on, that we never present the hard truths, the things that Jesus says, renounce everything, otherwise you cannot be my disciple. So we never present that because we are too busy or too focused on making people feel belonging. On the flip side, uh, the emergent church says that the traditional church has focused so much on believing first, such that they put up a barrier of who is in and who is out. And unless you believe, you are out. And this actually puts people off. So that is the tension between the two. And I feel it in, in my own church and in my own ministry as well. So how does uh, Belcher in this chapter deal with it? So after after presenting the point of views from the emergent church and also the traditional church, he then tells a story. So at this conference, Belcher uh, meets Stephen Cooper, who is another pastor, and they share a cab to dinner. And uh, let me quote from, from the book. I asked Stephen to summarize the third way of evangelism and community from a biblical standpoint. He took the challenge and summarized his views in the course of the 15-minute cab ride from downtown Miami to South Beach. It was brilliant. The highlights follow. He made the case that beyond the bounded set and relational set views of evangelism, there is a third way. End quote. Now, when he said bounded set, he's talking about the boundaries of uh, traditional churches. And the relational set talks about the emergent uh, church, which is uh, very relational. Okay, So there's this conflict between bounded and relational. Is there a third way? And in that chapter, in that section, you have Stephen explaining as they, go, as they are in that drive, as they're uh, driving towards dinner. And I, I quote, the, conversa the conversation is held, I quote, over the sound of Latin music from the taxi's radio. And that, uh, Stephen points out with increased intensity as they barrel down the freeway toward the beach. End quote. So you see that the conversation, right, is um, 
it's, it's inviting you to be in that taxi together with them. And in that conversation, Belcher asks questions. Why is this relevant? So what is wrong with this? So what does this mean for a third way? So you have this back and forth in the taxi ride and, and Belcher writes, okay? As they come uh, near the, the dinner venue, Belcher writes this. I sense this could be a breakthrough in my thinking. My anticipation was growing, end quote. And reading this, my, my anticipation was also growing because I also wanted to know what is the answer. Now, I don't want to tell too much because you deserve to sit in that cab ride to listen to that conversation and find out what is the biblical support for this third way that this book talks about, deep evangelism. And the answer, because I think that it's also important that I tell you what is the answer, um, but not in detail, is that the answer is both. You have to belong and you have to believe, and it is actually what the book describes as two circles. But if you're interested in this, again, um, I ask that you read the book. I think it's really worth reading. So every chapter in this uh, deep church uh, begins with that uh, back and forth between the bickering husband and wife. I mean, sorry. I mean, protesting, emerging, and traditional church. Then, in a cab ride or in a different story, Belcher describes how the third way looks like, and he always describes it uh, with his church in mind. So you have the theory, the, the arguments coming in, and you have the outworking of that theory, the practical side um, being described. So that this is a good book in that sense. Deep Church is the 2010 Christianity Today Book Award winner. Many love it, <laughs> many don't. I want to take time to share two criticisms made in some reviews. So these are some reviews made in blogs, Amazon, Goodreads, and so on. And yes, in this book review, you are going to hear my review of other people's book reviews. Now, hearing this, um, you will know the feathers that the Belcher has ruffled, and you will have to, as you listen to what I say, you will have to read for yourself whether the criticisms are valid or not. For example, one of the major criticisms made against this book is the way it handles the gospel and atonement. Early on in, uh, in, the, in the book, there is this segment where uh, John Piper of The Traditional meets with Brian McLaren of The Emerging. And very obviously, very clearly, there were differences uh, because of the atonement. Now, Piper links the atonement with the gospel. And for Piper, and for me, rejecting the atonement means rejecting the gospel. McLaren disagrees. He says that the gospel can be interpreted in various ways and doesn't need to include the atonement, or rather, he rejects the atonement. So there are irreconcilable differences between these two parties. The criticism against Deep Church is it attempts to reconcile what should be irreconcilable because these are two parties that, can, that is black and white. They cannot come together. So Jim Belcher himself has actually responded to that criticism and in two interviews at Gospel Coalition. Now, here are my thoughts. There is one key to understand the way Belcher uh, talks about unity and the way he even talks about the gospel and atonement. And the key to understanding this is who does Belcher quote in his book so every so often? Whose church is Redeemer Church modeled after and even named after, <laughs> who does he describe in the acknowledgement as a mentor? And who is the big name that endorsed this book? And the answer is Tim Keller. Now, Tim Keller has actually influenced uh, Jim Belcher in many ways. And Belcher in this book doesn't have the time or the pages to address contextualization or about uh, having the atonement explicitly mentioned in the gospel statement. To get that description or, or explanation, we need to read Tim Keller's Center Church. And let me just read a snippet from that, from that book. Keller writes, I want to resist the impulse, mainly among conservative evangelicals, toward creating a single one-size-fits-all gospel presentation that should be used everywhere, that serves as a test of orthodoxy. End quote. So, if you can understand uh, Keller's 
because Keller has his own critics <laughs> when it comes to contextualization. So Keller has his own critics, and then Belcher is in that camp. So, and again, if you understand Keller, he doesn't dismiss the atonement. He doesn't dismiss the gospel. He is as gospel-centered as the gospel coalition, of which he is a part of. Now, the second criticism is ecclesiology. From the title, <laughs> Deep Church, some have expected this book to be a book on ecclesiology, meaning what is the church. And any discussion or explanation on what is the church should bring out scripture verses like the body of Christ, the bride of Christ, the temple of the Lord, and we as living stones. And we should be able to see the church being built up from the foundation going up brick by brick. But we do not. Instead, what we see is a building, it's a church that has already been built called Emerging. Opposite it, we see another built-up church called Traditional. And in between, we have this third church called Deep Church. So some were very disappointed in not seeing the construction uh, process where the church is being built from the foundation up brick by brick. If only the book had somehow signaled this to the potential reader. Oh wait, he did. The subtitle for Deep Church is A Third Way Beyond Emerging and Traditional. So that is what Belcher wrote. If you want to know how the church is built from the ground up, Edmund Clowney's The Church is a popular recommendation. Personally, I recommend Greg Allison's Sojourners and Strangers, The Doctrine of the Church. And, as I hinted earlier, if you want a good book on the church with a strong emphasis on culture, you should read Tim Keller's Center Church, which is now published as three smaller books. Many love the book, Deep Church, because of its tone, its marriage counseling tone. But some on both sides have pointed out that uh, the way Belcher describes the, the Deep Church or traditional church is... Uh, a bit broad. What I mean by this is, do you remember the seven points made against the traditional church? Well, there are some traditional churches who do not have those problems or rather have already addressed them without needing to be emerging. They stayed traditional. They don't employ a third way. So it is the same building, maybe with different furnishing furnishings or a paint job or fence, but it is still the traditional church. And Kevin DeYoung in his review writes, uh, In fact, I don't think there is a single insight from the emergent church that cannot be gleaned from the best of the evangelical and specifically the Reformed tradition. We don't need a third way between emergent and traditional. We need a revitalized, reformed, evangelical church, end quote. So that is a point made by the traditional. The emergent have also made this point that uh, <laughs> the deep church sounds suspiciously like traditional plus. The foundation is actually on traditional as it attempts to uh, address the emergent uh, questions. And I think that uh, Kevin DeYoung's point and uh, other reviewers' points is valid. What is the state of this war? Did we win? Who's we? Is there peace? This is how Christianity Today uh, describes the emerging movement. If you go to their website now, I quote, Though a subject of great discussion in the late 1990s and early 2000s, the emerging movement has seemingly dropped off the map as of late. End quote. Did... Belcher's book have a role in that. I guess he and many others did do something about it by showing the differences between the emerging church and the traditional church. Everybody from both sides could see that there were irreconcilable differences. And this is where the marriage counseling metaphor breaks down. The two churches were never together. They were never married. And they were never intended to be together. In fact, this is more like neighbor counseling. And instead of throwing bricks at each other's windows, the neighbors just got on with their own lives. Should we read this book now that there is no noise? I mean, there is no war. 
So should we read it as a historical interest as we read World War I and World War II? Well, Belgians did say that this book was for four groups of people. Number one, those caught in between emerging and traditional. So you're in the traditional church and you hear the seven protests. So if you are right now in a traditional church and you hear things like the sermon is boring and perhaps ineffective, the worship is, uh, doesn't match with the modern day times, you hear that people are more interested in what people believe rather than making people belong. So if that sort of comments is still happening where you are, this book is still relevant to you. Number two, it is written for those who want to know what is emerging. And uh, I imagine that would be of historical interest, but uh, maybe for some people would, uh, would want to know where uh, current ideas, what the church is grappling with, can it be traced to that emergent uh, movement? Well, this book could help answer that question. Number three, it's for sem seminarians who want to figure out how to do church. Remember that criticism about uh, building the church uh, from the foundation and laying the brick uh, one at a time? Well, the thing is that the seminarians already have studied that or should have in their theology classes. It's supposed to be part of their study to read uh, books like uh, Clowney or Allison. Now, the way this deep church works is that um, it takes that theory and presents to you what's happening in the shouting match of the real world where you have people who are arguing and it is very, you are really in the trenches sort of thing. So you, you have to build something, you have to build a church. And so seminarians may, may value what uh, Belcher is writing over here as they go into the world to build or to uh, establish their ministries. Number four, uh, Belcher actually writes with, uh, with a care and a heart for pastors who are close to burnout as a struggle with the ministry, and uh, he wants to give them an encouragement. And this book is supposed to tell pastors that there is a third way. There is, a, there is another way of doing church, and they don't have to be stuck in a rut. And they can do this without abandoning uh, core doctrines or principles. All right, So that is what uh, Belcher is trying to do in this book. Now, to the four groups mentioned earlier, I would add a fifth. This book is also helpful for those who want to model on how to respond to conflicts. Do you face, or do you expect to face, future conflicts on how to do church? It may not be emerging. I don't know whether the emerging will emerge again. It may be another teaching, and we have had so many different types of teaching over the years and decades and millennia. It could be another worship war. I don't know. Now, this book may model a response for you. You may find that it is too soft. You may find that it is too hard. But it is one of those rare books that talks to both sides of the, of the divide and try to bridge it. All right? So that is uh, something that you can, we can gain from this book. An example of that that I believe is very hot today is politics. Uh, Christians in, in the political spectrum are really shouting at each other. And uh, would this book uh, help us in that? Maybe not, because uh, politics is not what he is writing about in Deep Church. But he is writing a book about politics now, and it is coming out soon. You see, in the past 10 years, uh, Dr. Jim Belcher has actually uh, left Redeemer Church, the church he founded. And along the way, he has written a second book titled In Search of Deep Faith. He was also a professor at Knoxville Seminary, which he resigned to become the president of Providence Christian College. And last year, he resigned as the president of Providence Christian College to establish the Institute of New Vital Center. This New Vital Center refers to a political center that is meant to bridge the political divide. Do you remember what was his PhD on? His PhD was on political philosophy. So I expect uh, Belcher to bring his marriage counseling skills and storytelling skills into the 
hottest war between Christians in America today. What would be the title of that book? Hmm, Deep Politics? Deep Government? Deep State? I don't know. But if it's anything like Deep Church, I plan to read it. I highly recommend this book to any Christian who thinks about the church or struggles with how to do church or talks to people who say there is only one way to do church because Dr. Jim Belcher has shown that there is a third way. This is a reading and reader's review of Deep Church, a third way beyond emerging and traditional by Dr. Jim Belcher. Before you go, let us deeply consider how you can support podcasts that you like. You could just take and take and not make any gestures of support, or you could sell everything you have and give it to the podcast creator. I suggest a third way. What you can do is subscribe, write a review, and if you want to do more, I'm sure your favorite podcast has a website with more details. For example, something like readingandreaders.com. If Deep Church was too much deep thinking for you, then you will count it all joy to know that the next book review is on a lighter subject, namely joy. Until next time, thank you for listening.